wages and salary and, 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 uh, and tithing and giving goes up to over 300 references. And so I went to like 16 or 17 other versions of God's word. Some I found more, some I found less. So what I did was I, I, I took some, some scripture that really applied to us when, when we uh, started working through our money challenges. And, and the first one, I hate to always say like, what's your favorite Bible verse? Because there's, it should all be your favorite Bible verse, right, from beginning to end. But 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.16 is the one that is always uh, stuck in my mind because it applies to all scripture. And, and this person says everything in the scriptures is God's word. All, has been, all of it is useful for teaching and helping uh, people and for correcting them and showing them how to live. The second next verse is so that the man of God will be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So God is basically telling you, know, this, this, his word is there for all of us, for everything we go through, and it's to prepare us for every good work. And uh, in the many ministries that Dawn and I have been involved in, it's been something that we've always had to go into God's word for guidance and direction and for help and for coaching and for, for training to know what we're doing. Uh, other verses, uh, 1 Timothy 6.10, 1 Timothy 6, the love of money causes all kinds of trouble. Some people want money so much they have given up their faith and caused themselves a lot of pain. Proverbs uh, 11, 4, when God is angry, money won't help you. <laughs> Obeying God is the only way to be saved from death. Ecclesiastes 5, 10, if you love money and wealth, you will never be satisfied with what you have. Amen. This doesn't make a bit of sense. Matthew 6, 24, you cannot be a slave to two, to two masters. You will like one more than the other or be more loyal to one than the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Hebrews uh, 13, 5, don't fall in love with money. Be satisfied with what you have. The Lord has promised he will not leave us or desert us. In Romans 4, 4, uh, money's paid to workers isn't a gift. It is something to earn by working. And we apply that same thing with our children when it comes to allowance. You don't get allowance just for being a kid. You get allowance, you do your chores and do what you gotta do and you will uh, get money. Uh, this is uh, something that Dawn doesn't even know I put this in there because Dawn loves pennies. And now, we, we, have, we have money. We, you know, we're, uh, we're not poor. Uh, but if Dawn goes out the car at Publix and she finds three pennies on the ground, she stops, she picks them up, says, look what I got. And she's excited because she got these three pennies. And with, with the money we have, and I, I'm just I'm trying to be humble here, but uh, when I buy and resell and refinish furniture, if I get a dresser and I find two quarters in the bottom of the dresser, I'm like, yes, because that's money that somebody just kind of like left behind. So when Donna and I were first married in 1979, we had a lot of challenging money issues. We had one child, we moved into our brand new house and our total payment, mortgage, taxes, insurance, everything, was $365.44. I'm like, man, why did we buy this house? We can't afford this. And it was a bit of a struggle because Dawn worked at a bank in Jensen Beach and then she had to work late on Friday night because none of the girls could balance. So she had to work till like six or 6.30 and I'm here walking with this kid for like three hours in downtown Jensen Beach. And she also worked on Saturday a half a day because the bank was open a half a day on Saturday. I was an electrician and I also worked at a carpet store in Jensen Beach cutting and measuring remnants and if you're in a carpet store for more than three hours, your, your throat and everything gets full of carpet fibers, right? Then I worked on Sunday for the builder, cleaning up job sites. So it was like no weekends, hardly for either of us. We, we shared like custody of our daughter in our own house because she was working, I was going running back and forth. And it was really a struggle. Um, I also would scrap copper, I picked up soda bottles. Uh, there was something laying down on the job site or a trash bin somewhere, I was going for it because I needed that money to, to kind of survive. Um, and pennies and spare change were kind of a necessity. 
Mm -hmm. uh, there was times where Dawn would go shopping and she'd be digging in the bottom of her purse. And we'd go stick her hand in the back of the couch and we'd find some money. And she'd say, I need $30. I'm like, for what? I need to go shopping for you and me and your daughter. I'm like, well, what am I going to have for the week? She said, well, you figure that out because I need this money. So it was, it was a struggle, even at $365.44, it was a struggle. Uh, but as time went on, uh, more babies came, and Dawn had eventually quit her job at the bank because she was spending more time in doctors and, and doctor bills than she was making. So I picked up a job teaching at the college for like 23 years, and um, Dawn still was digging around picking up pennies, she still picks up pennies. I think we get out of the car tonight at the church, she's probably yeah, looking there for a penny. That's so true. And they don't care, yeah. it, it's not even just a penny. Back in the day it was pennies, but now I pay her money. Like, sure. I'm like, okay, I'll take it. <laughs> so I, I was, uh, here's this funny thing, I was at an estate sale, because I'll tell you a little more about that career later. I was at an estate sale on Friday, and here's this butter tub on this, messy, dirty garage on a workbench, and it's full of like two handfuls of pennies. And I said to the people doing the estate sale, I said, hey, you know, there's like money over here? Yeah, we know, it's just pennies. <laughs> I'm like, well, yeah, but there's, there's money there. And they're like, you want it? You can have it. <laughs> Darn right I want it. <laughs> so I gave me a, a thing of pennies. You know, it's, it's money. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, when we raised our five kids, uh, we used to buy them plastic piggy banks. And that's like a hard thing to find. You can't really find a piggy bank anymore. When I was growing up, they were everywhere. We bought our kids plastic piggy banks. We said, we're going to teach them how to save. Well, it really didn't work too well because <laughs> they got a little bit of money. One would take from the other. Or they want to go out and spend it. And, and it really didn't work. But we still have piggy bank. Mm -hmm. And we have this plastic piggy bank. And it started maybe about, about 12, 15, maybe 20 years ago yeah. when I said, I'm not going to spend $60 for a Christmas tree. That's just not me. So John said, well, let's have a piggy bank. So we would save up all our spare change all year. We have enough money to buy that Christmas tree. So it's just a little example of a, of a, a little savings thing to cover a cost that you don't want to go out at Christmas time and shell out 65 or maybe now $100. For, for our Christmas tree. So um, we buy our grandkids piggy banks, but that doesn't help either. Um, and an example that I did at, at, at my work, uh, last year we took up a collection for United Against Poverty, and I said to all my employees, I said, gather up all your spare change, give it to United Against Poverty because they're feeding people that are food insecure, and, and we want to try to help them. In four weeks, 30 days, we got $861.44. And I had ladies digging in their purses, guys going in their desk drawers, people going in their cars, and one guy came with an ashtray in his car, he keeps his spare change in there, and almost $1,000 for that. So the, the whole point of this is just, that, you know, money adds up, and, and we don't take any money for granted, and we take all money as, as a blessing. So. Uh, there's just a little lesson there on, on pennies, but the next thing I want to talk about on the next page is an emergency fund. And uh, many of you know or experience with an emergency fund, um, but Dave Ramsey, who is a, a Christian money guy, financial specialist, um, in his survey found out that 36% of Americans do not have enough money readily available to cover a $400 emergency. Many years ago, we used to call this the cookie jar. Uh, it is something that's unexpected. Is it necessary? We have to ask ourselves, is it unexpected? Is it necessary? Is it urgent? An emergency fund can be used for an unexpected car repair, a trip to Home Depot for something, because you can't go to Home Depot to buy a part for your toilet. You gotta buy like eight parts for your toilet. Make sure you got the right one, right? Um, Something we grew up with, medicine. Oh, one kid would get sick, the other one gets sick. The other one gets sick. We spend more time at Gray Drugs and, and, uh, and uh, Walgreens than I could uh, think. Uh, visit to a doctor or a doctor copay. 
uh, a service call for your dryer, you know, an increase in your electric bill, uh, increase in your, for instance, let's see, garbage bill, I won't talk about that, higher gas prices, and, and all these little things that kind of just like pop up, right? So the idea of an emergency fund is to have this little bit of money put away in a cookie jar or somewhere that allows you to cover the cost without stressing over it. Um, you know, you don't need to stress or worry about where you're gonna get the money. Resort to high interest credit cards, which sometimes we do when we go somewhere to, to purchase something. We don't wanna ask a relative for money. Uh, we don't want to ask for a payment schedule. How about I give you so much a month? We don't wanna incur more debt. So how do you start an emergency fund? How do you put this like four or $500 away somewhere that if you need it in an emergency, you can call on it without having to pull out that plastic. So I have a couple of suggestions here. You can have a yard sale. Um, I suggest you have Dawn run your yard sale because the only way you're gonna make money is if she's running your yard sale. Um, you can sell something online, offer up, Craigslist, uh, let go, Facebook Marketplace. You know, there's a time when the kids let go of the Legos. And when they stop playing with Legos for about like a year or two, that's when you put them in a bag and you put them on Craigslist because you'd be surprised they're worth more than you paid for them. Wow. All right. Um, uh, check your couches and your car for extra coinage. Uh, if you have the opportunity, grab some overtime at work. Give up that $7 coffee, daily coffee for a month. Eat one meal out less a month. And that will help you to, to fund this emergency fund that you just kind of put away. So when you get a call and say, oh, we gotta go to the doctor, I need money for a copay, we don't get paid until Friday, this is, this is Monday, <laughs> we need $75, and you just have that $75 to pay. You don't incur any more debt, and you just gotta remember that you have gotta replenish that money sometime later, but it's nice to have that, that little bit of emergency fund. Another way you can do it, and this is something I, that I, uh, I gave to my employees a number of years ago, is the money challenge. The money challenge is pretty cool because it gets you into the habit of saving every week for a whole year. So the way it works is the first week you put $1 in that emergency fund account. The next week you put $2. And you gradually build yourself up to at the bottom right hand of the page you see $52 on the 52nd week, you'll have $1,378 in your emergency fund. Now, that's a little tough for some people, but imagine if you got just like three quarters of the way there. You have like $1,000. So, and this is not like, hey, let's go out to eat because it's our daughter's birthday and she wants to go for Chinese. No, it's like, hey, we got a flat tire and the tire is bad, and a new tire is going to be like 130 bucks. And we can just take that money out of the emergency fund, and we won't put it on the credit card. Because you see, there's a, what, what Dave Ramsey and, and, and others have found out, I've studied this a little bit, there's a psychological difference between paying with a plastic and paying with cash. I grew up in a cash society because I'm a boomer, okay? So we grew up with cash. But our millennials and our Gen X's and our Gen Y's and Gen Z's and Gen whatever's use plastic. There's now plastic credit cards for 12 year olds to get them in the habit. So you don't have that psychological feeling of spending money. It's just something that's kind of out there. Yes, sir. Our granddaughter, she's 21. She takes care of our cat when we go away. She comes over and gives our cat baked meat, they raw meat. So I pay her, she comes to the house, I was giving her cash, and I go, I says, Mom, you can't get me to stop giving her cash. I'm like, why not? She doesn't know what to do with it. She doesn't know how to run a bank and do anything with it. So I'm going to spend all of the money now, because she doesn't know what to do with it. So here's this, it's a simple example. You don't have to start at the first, you can start at any time you want, just put your own dates in it, and really try to commit yourself. But if you do it for a year, that's almost $1,400 in there. For any of these types of emergencies, you can call it an emergency fund. And uh, after a while, it's kind of fun because you see that I really can save this money. But the question now is, okay, I'm not, or I can't earn any more money. <laughs> I've only got so much money. This guy's talking about an emergency fund. 
how can I have more money for that emergency fund? And the way you're going to do it is by looking at the finances that you go through every day. And um, Dawn and I have done this <laughs> multiple occasions. We just did it uh, about a year or so ago, right, for our, for our finance guy. So uh, here's a little guide. It's a guide to, to, for individuals and couples. It says, first, to pray together as a couple, thanking God for his provision in your lives. Invite God to be in the midst of your finances. Ask God to guide you in your financial decisions. Ask God to encourage you to give back to him. See, when, when we had our financial struggles about 20 years ago, when we prayed, and, and I'm praying, God, give us provision, give us money, and don't say, God, give us the ability to tithe and give away more. I'm like, well, we don't have that much. So you may have heard the story where we got done one day and we paid all our bills on the bare minimum. We had like $150 left till payday, which is like a week away. And Don says, oh, no, we've got to write a tithe check. I said, no, it can wait a little bit. He says, no, we've got to write a tithe check, right? So we wrote that tithe check. And three days later, we get a, a letter in the mail from a doctor saying that we overpaid on the bill and gave us $100 back. And I said, well, I got $100. Don said, no, we got $90. We got to give $10 in for a tithe. So I knew I was not going to win this battle, and I'm glad I didn't because we, we learned some of these things. One of the things you can do is make a summary sheet of all your expenses. Do not leave anything out and be honest. So what I do is I gave you a little summary sheet on the next page. And we had to do this. Uh, just list all your creditors, okay? What your monthly payment is. And then set yourself a goal for next month. And just say you try to cut maybe 10%. Just try to cut 10%. Go down at the end of the first column and say, hey, our monthly expenses are 3000 If I could cut 10% out of each one of these, I could save, I could have $300 at the end of the month. I can give more. I can give more and I can save more and, and I can be prepared later on in life. So you make a summary sheet of all your expenses and tell you, be honest. And we, you have to do this. Ask God to show you where you can lower your expenses and discuss it together. People think sometimes it's like the wife's job or the man's job. It's, it's, a, it's a together job. Uh, when you're married, the two became one. You don't separate when the finance time comes. Uh, set a financial goal for each item for the next month. Track your reduction savings each month. And here's what we do when we're going to make a purchase. We have to ask ourselves three questions, and all financial experts will say, ask you, do I or do we need it, or do we just want it? Very important question. Do we need it now? Can we put on? Don will tell you that if I had my way, I'd have two pair of shoes my whole life because I wear them until... They practically fall off. But I said, I can get another week out of these shoes. He said, you are not going out with those shoes. You are not. I said, yeah, but I could wear them. What? Nobody will see them. I see them. So I'll stretch that pair of shoes. I'll stretch out the socks just the way I am. Uh, and this last question is, is there an alternative? And we'll talk about this a little bit later. You don't always have to have brand new. Our kids, <laughs> our girls, right? Our first two were girls. They didn't know what new clothes were unless somebody bought it for them. Dawn made all their clothes because she can make a dress for like $3. Nice dress. We still got them, by the way, right? Yeah. And, and matching dresses and stuff for like $3 instead of buying them at the store for 12 or 14 And to us, 12 or 14 in 1979 was a fortune. It was a fortune. So Dawn made a lot of their clothes. And when she couldn't make them, we went to the Goodwill when Goodwill was a good deal. Uh, yard sales. I can't tell you how many yard sales we went everywhere uh, trying to buy stuff because our kids needed clothes, but you can sometimes buy brand new clothes at a yard sale for a quarter or 50 cents. Um, I encourage you to do your bills together. If you tend to not agree, I encourage you to hold hands. It makes it a little bit easier. 
And the verse we have here is to give cheerfully because God loves a cheerful giver. And I think that's the, that's what came out of our financial dilemma 20 years ago was we really got a joy in giving that we didn't think we'd ever get. It was like, it was awesome. And God said, guess what? We're going to raise our tithe this month. We're going to raise our tithe this month. We're going to raise it this month. And a lot of times when we're coming here, she says, uh, should we raise our tithe again this week? Just go ahead. Uh, whatever you do on the phone, you do. Uh, each one of us must give what he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. God loves a cheerful giver. And, and I think that's, that's so important. And you really bring, by doing this, you not only bring joy by cutting down your expenses, but you bring joy by giving. So, I got some other ideas, some other what I call financial quick books. Um, and these are some of the things that, that we pretty much don't do. Eliminate subscription services like Netflix, Amazon Prime, Grubhub, Discovery Plus, Paramount Plus, Disney Plus, and all the other plus plus pluses. Um, when Dawn had her surgery, we got Discovery Plus, right? It was only $5 and something a month. Mm -hmm. After she got out of the chair and was able to walk, we don't have, we still have Disney Plus, Plus, Plus. We don't watch it anymore. Um, reduce the number of times you eat out. Not only is it unhealthy, but it costs you a lot of money. Eliminate the daily trips to Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts. I know that kind of hurts some people. Uh, but maybe you can do it like two days a week instead of five or seven days a week. Uh, what was it, Don? About three months ago, or I got hooked on that pistachio latte at Starbucks, <laughs> and I and I don't ever go to Starbucks. So I went there, and I'm thinking, man, that was like seven dollars. It was good, but was it seven dollars good? No, she can make me a whole pot of coffee for seven dollars. So. So we didn't do it. Uh, start shopping at thrift stores, yard sales, and garage sales. Uh, we do it. Uh, a lot of stuff I have comes from thrift stores and garage sales. It's the third or less price. Do your research before you buy. Uh, we have the ability now in this age to do a lot of research before we buy stuff. And it, it's, it's uh, sometimes... Amazon isn't the cheapest. Sometimes Bass Pro is not the cheapest. But do your research. If you can do your research and save six or seven dollars on an item, that's six or seven dollars more in, in your pocket. Considering consider borrowing things instead of buying them. So Mike, if you need a, a, a chainsaw, now you can buy one. I know a decent one runs $224 plus oil at Home Depot because I priced them the other day. Or you can say, uh, Joel, you got one or your father-in-law's got a chainsaw, right? Somebody's got one in your family. I do. You do. So, so, you know, I mean, how long are you going to use that chainsaw? Are you going to use it one time or two times? Maybe you can borrow it. And, uh, and, and save some money. So a lot of people don't borrow things anymore, but it, it's, a, it's a good alternative. Um, we say to start paying with cash, eliminate the use of credit cards whenever possible. Because when you pay with cash, you don't tend to buy all those extra things that you do when you have a credit card. Um, contact your cell service provider, find ways to reduce your payment. I think from the stories I'm told by my employees, if you call Comcast and say I'm switching over to AT&T, they automatically drop your payment by like $35. If you call AT&T, tell them I'm going to Comcast, they'll drop your payment by $35 and give you a free Kindle or an iPad or something. So um, that's something else to think about. Uh, set your AC to 77. You will not die. Yeah. <laughs> Dawn will die. I will die. <laughs> All right, so raise it one degree. Raise it one degree. <laughs> Combine travel trips, shop and travel with a friend if you have a friend that likes to shop and travel with you. Um, start giving or increase your giving. And, you know, when you, it's like surrendering your 
your your connection to that money and telling God, you know, it's all your money, and I'm giving it back to you for service for your kingdom. That remarkable things start to happen. Uh, so more low hanging fruit. And Tim gave me a couple of these. Um, Xfinity. So I guess if your kid is on uh, free or reduced lunch, you can save like thirty dollars a month if you qualify in your Xfinity bill. Won't help us. We don't have those kids anymore. Um, there is a tab on the wearediscovery.com uh, website under financial help. Uh, again, you're going to hear this theme a lot. Use cash. Use cash. Use cash. They say when people go out to eat, they spend 20% less money if they pay with cash. Mm -hmm. They all of a sudden don't need that dessert, they're full. Yeah. But if you got the credit card, you gotta have that dessert, you just gotta try it. Um, trying a pantry challenge. This is something that I, I found like three weeks ago, and I said, boy, this is really cool. And, and a part of saving money on groceries is to make sure your family consumes everything that you purchase. Every month or so, hold a pantry challenge during which you try to use up as many pantry goods as possible before you go shopping again. I've been doing that for about a couple months now. No, I'm like, crushed tomatoes again? Where do we get all this? <laughs> That's right. So a pantry challenge helps you to cut down on waste and lets you get a new sense of how much you're overbuying, too. You don't throw away the food either. Yeah. Uh, no, people don't always throw it away. They donate it to food drives, unfortunately. Yeah. Eliminate bad habits. But besides affecting your mental and physical health, bad habits also cost a lot of money. Behaviors like smoking cigarettes, playing the lottery, drinking, making impulse purchases, gambling, are also harmful to your financial health. Sure, it's a lot of fun when you do it, but imagine the toll it takes on your health and on your bank account. Mm -hmm. uh, people say to me, sometimes you're so lucky you should go play the lottery. I said, I've never won the lottery. They said, how come? I said, because I never played. I just can't, I just can't bring myself to spend that $5. We're a one in like 28 million chance of winning. Uh, so if I did win, I'd change my mind, but you know. Most of your for our money to get away. Well, we did, we did, and, uh, and there's, there's no guarantee. So uh, another thing that, that we have been doing, and uh, a majority of the financial experts recommend doing is having what they call a side hustle. It's called by many different terms, many different things, but a side hustle is that extra work that you do outside of your daily job uh, to earn money that you could use to pay off debt, save money for purchases down the road, or even save for retirement. And, and I have a whole class I do one day on retirement. Unfortunately, the people that want to attend a retirement class are over 60, and they're too close to retirement to be planning for retirement. The time for planning for retirement is when you're young. And, and um, I, I get all my employees and I tell them, go on ssa.gov, contact their financial planner, look at your retirement, look at what you have, and make a plan. And typically they tell me, I'm only 45. Well, those 45s are now 60. And now it's like too late for them. Or they're, um, they feel it's too late. The time to start is now, at when you're young. And I wish we had a lot more younger people in here because even 20-somethings need to really look at their retirement and, and what's down the road. When I was 20, they said Social Security won't be around when you get ready to retire. I got another year or so, so I hope it still stays around uh, to see if they're still true. But um, that's very serious. But if not just your Social Security retirement, your other retirement that you have, and by putting little bits of money away uh, over time can help to fund that. Some people have told me, hey, Joel, I'm gonna be working until I'm 75. Well, assuming you can work at 75 and they want you to work and your brain still functions and you can still walk and talk, maybe so. 
Uh, right now, there's 3.5 jobs for every unemployed American in the United States. So, right now. But that number is going to continue to grow, and they say the next eight years would be over five people for every a job, every available job in the United States. So, there's some examples of a side hustle. Then I'll tell you a little story, okay? Um, some examples are Uber, Instacart, pizza delivery, uh, yard cleanup, pool cleaning, house cleaning, <laughs> gutter cleaning, somebody could do that for me. Uh, decorating, car washing, laundry service, ironing, and the list goes on and on and on and on. The last one in that little list there is selling antiques and collectibles. So Dawn started, actually started doing crafts when, in her sewing business, but our oldest son had asthma and he'd go to school for four days and then the hospital for three days. And Dawn couldn't work anymore because she spent all her money on medicine. So she decided that she's gonna go out, she's a good sewer and a good baker, and she started making things and selling them at craft shows. And back then I was making like $200 a week. She'd go out on a Saturday and come back with $1,000. I was like, whoa, whoa, I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> but she did it for a number of years, and it kind of expanded out. She was at the White City Antique Mercantile for years, um, selling antiques and some of her crafts and things. And then she made the mistake about 10 years ago, uh, getting me to quit teaching at the college and go into business with her. And... Um, well, I make furniture and I paint furniture and we buy and sell antiques. We buy antiques all over the country and we sell them basically all over the country. And it's a, it's a very, very, very lucrative side hustle. I make sometimes more there than I make at the city and I make really good money at the city. But the problem with our side hustle is in order to make a lot, you gotta put in a lot. But there are other kinds of side hustles that you can do that you can be successful without killing yourself. Um, uh, we had a, uh, a friend, actually, uh, the guy that took me to church and led me to the Lord, Mark, right, lived behind us. Mark was a fireman in City of Hollywood Fire Department. Well, you know how the fire department works? You go into work like Sunday night at eight o'clock and Monday night at eight o'clock, you already got three days in because you slept for like 12 hours. And then you come home for two days and you go back for 16 hours and you're done for three more days. It's a great gig, but Mark had all this extra time. So he had a pool business, he would clean pools. He didn't clean pools, here he cleaned pools down in like Jonathan's Landing, that was some nice high-end thing. So, so Mark made a lot of money, he made more money doing pools two days a week than fire department five days a week. And then when Mark got tired of that and decided to move to Mount Dora, he didn't give up his business, he sold his business. <laughs> so he sold his accounts to somebody for like $160,000, as well as making killer money the whole time. And if you clean pools or you cut grass, uh, almost anybody can cut grass, if you do those kind of things as your side hustle one or two days a week and turn around and sell your accounts when you're done, do it for a season. But you don't have to do all that manual work. You can iron. Dawn would love it if somebody would do her ironing. She doesn't like to iron anymore. She did, but she doesn't like to iron. Um, or house sitting. Uh, was it Dawn, uh, Sarah's, uh, Emily's friend, House sits. People go on vacation. She goes and she sits in the house. And she watches TV. And she gets like a couple hundred dollars a day. Now, we don't all have the advantage to doing that. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's an opportunity. Uh, pet sitting. Dog walking. I don't want to walk a dog. Well, you can have a couple of dog walking jobs and make like a hundred dollars a week. It's good little side hustle to build up your emergency fund or to pay off a debt or to save for something that you, you might want to purchase. So I recommend there that, that you, know, you do your research before 
It should be something that you know how to do. Don't don't jump into the 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 uh, car repair business if you don't have any tools. <laughs> Uh, but there's a lot of those little side hustle kind of things, and you can do them together uh, as we do. Uh, we drive each other crazy. Most of the driving is done by me. Uh, talk about the crazies. Um, but we do very, 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 very well. And by doing it, we're able to write off our, our trips to North Carolina, our trips to Georgia, <laughs> stuff like that, because we all do it in, in the name of our business. We have fun. And, and it's something we enjoy. We enjoy, you know, unearthing these treasures uh, like they do on, you know, Antiques Roadshow or, or, uh, or uh, Antique Archaeology and these other kinds of shows. But ours is inscripted. Ours is natural, normal. We love going to estate sales. And, you know, we, we find, we, we learn something with estate sales. And, and last week I did four or five of them in Port St. Lucie. Sometimes we do some of these estate sales in Fort Pierce or in Bureau Beach in these high-end homes. And usually it's from these older folks that, that pass away. And we see houses that are just literally packed with hundreds of thousands of dollars of collectibles and things that they didn't even know they had. The family didn't know they had. And the shame of it is that they hold on to all these physical things, all these, these physical stuff. And when they pass away, the kids call in the antique dealer or the estate dealer and say, get rid of all this crap. Mm -hmm. We want to sell grandma's house. They're not interested in anything that's in it except maybe grandma's jewelry, grandpa's gold watch, maybe some of his tools. But they basically leave everything else behind. And it just, it kind of taught us because, you know, we're hoarders too. So we're learning how to get rid of a lot of stuff that we have. And this goes to this one because this guy would appreciate these tools. And this we donate to Habitat for Humanity. This we donate to our friends at Mustard Seed. This we donate. We, and we got all those little piles in our house where all this stuff is going to because we collected it and we thought we needed it. We really don't. We really don't. And we've been in some houses where we find 70, 80, 100 pair of shoes, not worn shoes, in a box, wrapped up in tissue paper. Five or six, eight sets of silverware, just piles of things that people have. So I think sometimes that, that we, um, we don't really need what we buy we, we want it and you know one of the things that 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 we've noticed too and we'll talk about a little bit more your friends have it and even people that aren't your friends but they're under that friends label on Facebook or on social media and wow look what they have I don't go on social media I have a social media uh, uh, cop right there uh, Dawn tells me what I need to know on social media. Seriously. <laughs> you know this guy from high school? We graduated high school in 1975 together. Those who don't know the story, we met in 19, October 18, 1969 in seventh grade. Okay. So we graduated together in 1975. She'll say, oh, did you get a, this uh, uh, message from Doug? Doug who? He was in our high school class. I'm like, no, in 1975. So she's like my, my social media, she's like my content person. She just weeds out what I need to know, what I don't need to know. And I don't like to see it because you get tempted to, to keep up with the Joneses. You know, they got a new car. They go Carol's, they got a big chicken coop in their backyard. We want one too. And that's kind of what, what people do. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. But look at this side hustle. Look at this kind of thing. Uh, maybe it's something that you could or, or want to do. Uh, I have a couple of my employees that do transcribing. They get sent a, uh, a tape, a tape, a recording, and they could take and take that recording and they type it up for doctors. Ladies, one of my, one of my uh, uh, employees, she said, tell them, I'm learning all kinds of stuff about medical. And 
then the doctor went into surgery and she said, I don't want to know anything more about medical because she has to transcribe everything that he says and, and type it all up. But she said, I make like $400 a week. She said, but it's just getting kind of gross. So she didn't really like the content, but she liked the money. So that, that, that's an example. Uh, I've also included for you, um, right behind your agenda, 10 millionaire money tips. So I have a couple of books by millionaires. I have a, um, I go on this website where I Google, I find out this list of millionaires and I Google them and I find out what they have to say um, about money. And some millionaires have like 100 tips, some have eight. So I kind of narrow it down, get the, the top 10. And this is just for you to look at. You don't have to follow them. It's not gonna make you a millionaire. This is just some of the things they do. <laughs> millionaires avoid the use of credit cards. Even cash back credit cards and definitely taboo retailer credit cards. Because what the retailer wants, he doesn't want your credit, he wants your name, he wants your information, he wants your email, and he or she wants to send you messages to entice you to buy things. And if you don't buy things, what I like is Harbor Freight. I don't even know Harbor Freight. They sell crappy, junky tools, but it's one of the largest tool companies in the world. Right? And the owner has like a 300-foot yacht in the Fort Pierce Marina. He's a multi, multi, multi-millionaire. He's got a trick that if I don't buy something, because when you buy something in Harbor Freight, you gotta give me your phone number. And if I don't buy something in like three months, he sends me a message. But he doesn't send me a message like, hey, Joel, we miss you, are you okay? Are you sick? You know, so, no, he says, I've got a free gift for you. So I go to the store to get my free gift. He gives me a screwdriver, mm -hmm. a screwdriver. like. Yeah, not even a dollar. It's like there's like six for a dollar. They say, "Well, here's your set of screwdrivers." I'm like, wow. And and they say, uh, "Well, we got all these deals here today." And it seems like as soon as I get into Harbor Freight, I get a text on my phone, like he knows I'm there. <laughs> he sends me a text and says, "Check out the savings on aisle six. What do I do? I go down to aisle six. I said, "Man, I don't need an air compressor. That's all there is on aisle six. but sent me over there. But you know, there's something else I might like over there too. And then somebody walks up and says, can I help you here today? How about a compressor? I said, nah, I've got three compressors. I don't need any more. Thank you. But it's what the retailers do. So I avoid those retailer credit cards. Walgreens is, you know, if you know, Walgreens is having a lot of serious money problems right now. Serious money problems. Um, my assistant who works for me, his wife is a head pharmacist down in Wellington. And she's uh, working for, far, for Walgreens to do their online prescription business. So now when you go to the doctor and you get a prescription, you won't get it filled today, you'll get it filled tomorrow. So it'll get shipped out of Canada at midnight tonight and be on your doorstep at five o'clock tomorrow morning. They're doing away with their sale stores because they're losing so much money. But if you look at the marquee on Walgreens, on their sign, what does it say? Apply for a credit card today. Now, I think what they're trying to do is make sure you have enough money for your medicine to give you a credit card. What they really want to do is get your information so they can make more money from you so they don't go bankrupt because Rite Aid is trying to buy Walgreens, what's left of Walgreens anyway. So millionaires do not use credit cards. They use debit cards or cash. Millionaires recommend to avoid large debt consolidation loans. Because all it does is takes your debt and rolls it into a ball, and instead of paying maybe two or three years, you're going to pay 11 years, but you'll be totally debt free for less money per month. We don't need to pay less money a month because we already found ways to save a ton of money a month. So let me keep paying those bills at the full rate. Let me pay them off. Don't give me a consolidation loan that I'll be paying on forever because within that 10 years, you may want to buy a house or a car, but now you got this debt this consolidation loan that may be holding you back. Stay away from the whole life life insurance policies. 
My dad used to sell whole life life insurance policies for Prudential back in the 60s. My dad made all kinds of money. And when I got old enough to have a family, dad said, son, you better buy a whole life life insurance policy. He said, here's the way it works. You pay us so much money a month and we're gonna give you or your spouse $10,000 when you die. But here's the cool thing. We're gonna give you 1% interest on your payment. So it's kind of like a bank. That's cool. But here's another advantage. If you wanna borrow money, you can borrow your money back from us at 6%. So you pay money in for premiums, you have insurance, and then if you need money, you can borrow some of your own money back at 6% from the insurance company. But not to worry, because if you die before that, they're gonna take it off the balance and she won't get that much money. Mm -hmm. They don't care if you ever pay it back or not. And when you get done to paying it, like almost paying it off, they say, how about another 10 grand? You can buy something, you can buy a car. Well, you could back then. So stay away from whole life, go to term life. Mm -hmm. Term life insurance is about 1 to 1 10th the cost for three times the coverage. I look at life insurance as a death benefit, not as a savings account. Do not buy a new car. And I say a little caveat, unless you plan on keeping that car for 15 years, do not buy a new car. So another side story, because you know I'm always looking at things, right? So Dawn wants me to get rid of my 11-year-old Honda CRV because she don't like it. She wants me to get a Honda Ridgeline. I said, well, it looked kind of nice, kind of like a pickup, a car. It's kind of a little weird. And uh, so I wonder how much they are. Twenty, thirty thousand? No, forty-two thousand dollars. Forty-two thousand for a car. So I say, you know, maybe there's an alternative. So. I look at one that's almost the same car, 14 months old, $31,000. Big difference. Still got the same warranty. I think it's still clean. It can't smell that bad after a year, right? It's same color, same everything. And if I go to Carvana and I tell them I want it, they'll bring it to my house tomorrow. I mean, I don't have to go to a salesman. They'll tell me exactly what I'm gonna pay. They, they want my credit score, they want this and this and that. They tell me exactly what I gotta pay, they'll bring it to my house and take my car away and give me like 11,000 for my car. What a deal. But I save over $10,000. I don't have to go to the dealer telling me, well, I'll give you a warranty on the, on the Chrome, I'll give, you, you know, I'll give you a windshield wiper fluid, we'll do this, we'll do this, we'll do that, or run your price up another six or $7,000. But again, this is something that millionaires don't do. Uh, I've ever seen a book, uh, Sam Walton's book before he died, was this, this guy that, that owned Walmart, where $29 billion when he died, drove an old Chevy pickup truck, an old red faded out pickup truck. And they said, Sam, why don't you get a new truck? You could afford anything. He said, I just like this truck. And has had not made a payment in like 33 years. And there's Sam Walton, who could have bought dealerships if he wanted to. Do not co-sign loans for anyone, family, or friend. Some that millionaires don't do. Uh, avoid home equity loans and lines of credit. And, and the problem sometimes with the home equity loan or line of credit, if it's big enough, there are adjustable rates. So when you get it, you may get it at only 2 or 3%, but you could wind up it's going to fluctuate with the, with the interest rate. You could wind up paying six or seven percent, but that wasn't what they told you when you got that second mortgage. So my suggestion is, if you're going to do something like that, you set it up to pay it off in a year or 15 months, and not drag it over the term. Because what they'll do on a home equity loan or a line of credit is kind of drag it out for like 12 years, which is that you know the odds of the interest rate going up a little bit in that time are are, are pretty good. So you, you kind of limit the, uh, the term of your home equity loan or line of credit. The other one I talk about is again for millionaires, stop keeping up with the Joneses. 
Um, social media is the biggest enemy. It's just the biggest enemy. You see what other people got, what other people are doing, and you want to go out there and do it. And um, I have a sneaking suspicion that retailers look at social media and they find out that a friend of mine just bought a new Honda. For some reason, I get ads from Honda wanting to sell me a Honda Ridgeline. I'm like, who told them? Who told these people? But because I went and saw that a friend of mine had it, and I looked at their car, and I communicated with them, I'm like, man, that's pretty cool. It, Honda knows that I want to have this car. But they're watching and, and following everything that you do. Keeping up with the Joneses is not that great, because those Joneses may not be able to make those payments on that car. <laughs> that's what I'll get it a year later at half price. But, <laughs> you know, the, the, the Joneses, um, you don't know everything about the Joneses. And they may be struggling, but some people just have to have what other people have. And, and that's one of the biggest problems I have with social media. Um, you know, and, and I really don't care what, what other people have. People say, well, so-and-so got a new car. Yeah, but, you know, I haven't had a car payment in four years. I'm loving it. So keeping up with the Joneses, ignore them. Avoid social media. And the Joneses really aren't that happy. Have an investment plan, even a small investment plan. If you go through and you look at some of this stuff in the next couple of days, and you say, you know what, I think we can do this. We can pinch a little here. We can pinch a little there. Have an investment plan. So you know what, we can invest. I say invest like, you know, to, to uh, give it to a, a, a financial group. Or, or, or a financial consultant, a, a Christian financial consultant that won't charge you anything. They don't give you recommendations on where to put your money to make it grow. So you have an investment plan. Where you were in debt, your debt's coming down, but your savings, your investment are going up. Um, millionaires live within their means. Now you, you may say, well, it's okay for millionaires, they got a lot of money. A friend of mine just retired, but Saturday went to his retirement party. <laughs> so he says to his wife, how much money do we have to have to keep the house up? What did, he tell, what did she tell him? 12,000. 12,000 a month. Wow. You're not living beyond your means? Now luckily he sold his business for 22 million. So he's got 10 million in the bank. I don't think he'll go broke anytime soon. But most millionaires that I know, I don't even know that they're millionaires until they tell me. Because we go out to eat the lunch, I buy them lunch. <laughs> They, they don't live beyond their means. And how do you do that? You have to look at your budget. Look at your budget. Go down that budget sheet. Now, we just did this because we have a, um, a financial team um, that we've had for a long time. Um, Bob is like 70-something, right? And Mo mm -hmm. is like maybe 30, 30-something. 30 These guys go over my financials and they... They go over everything. Well, you got this. Well, you got this. We recommend this. We recommend that. And they give me some really, really, really good, sound advice that, that's paid off. But he just told Don and I, he said, I think you guys need to go look at your budget again. Now, he doesn't know where our money's going or anything like that. He just knows about what I got in retirement and investments and everything. And we got this eye opener. We're like, oh my gosh, how do we spend that much money for food? We got less people in our house now than we ever did, and we're spending more money. But now we're eating out of the pantry, so it's like really cool. We're saving money. But you need to do that. You need to do that once in a while. Just look at your expenses. It, this is, has to be something that you do like constantly. You can't get away from it. I have to say, this is where I am. I'm going to spend some time on this. I'm going to devote Monday night or, or Sunday night or Saturday night or whatever you want to do. Pick that time and devote yourself to that and look at the bills and say, you know what? Hey, we saved $20 on our electric bill. We do that all year. That's another $240. We can double up on our car payments, or we can uh, uh, you know, uh, give more to, to the church, uh, to kingdom work. So, so this is something, the only way you're gonna know if you live beyond your means is to do your budget every month. Another thing that, that was, I was surprised at, because I don't think millionaires got tax refunds, but we know they don't pay it's tax, so I don't know how they get refunds. But don't splurge your tax refund. And we did it for years, right? We, we get a tax refund, I'm like, man, we got two grand. What are we gonna buy? We should have taken that two grand and put it in the bank and make it like we didn't have it. Unless, of course, we needed it for, for an emergency thing. But again, these are simple tips. 
simple things you can do to what the millionaires do, what, what they recommend. The last thing I'm going to give you. I have a question. Yes. Um, number six. Yes. Um, what does LOC stand for? Line of credit. Okay. And what do you mean by um, the 90 day? I'm assuming the right side is what we should do. So, what is the 90 day same as cash for financing? And okay. Especially use other people's money. <laughs> yeah. We love to use other people's money. Dawn loves to use other people's money. Because remember, she collects the pennies, right? So she loves to use other people's money. Uh, what was the last thing? The, the range. The new stove. The new stove. The new stove. I love it. You know, so the motherboard computer goes out for the stove. $630. For $830, I get a brand new stove. That's like a no-brainer, right? I had to have a stove because she cooks and bakes everything. So you gotta get a new stove. So she goes to Jetsons and says, uh, well, what kind of payment deal can I get? They're like, what? She says, well, you know, we don't pay interest. And do you have a credit card? Yeah, but we're not using it. Uh, you know, we uh, get like 90 days or 60 days, same as cash, we make payments for 60 days, there's no interest and everything. Oh yeah, we got that. Now everywhere she goes, rooms to go is like, oh, there she is again. She don't wanna pay for nothing. Get 60 days, same as cash. Or most, some of them are a year. Some are a year. Now, sometimes it, comes, sometimes it comes with a credit card, you know, and they say, okay, yeah, we'll do that for you, no payments, and they send you a credit card in the mail, just in case you want to buy something. But <laughs> She cuts it up right away. I'm like, what's that? It's a new credit card. What'd you cut it up for? We're not using it. And, but, again, you don't pay interest. So if I'm gonna pay $850 for a range, I'm only gonna pay $850 for a range. If you put it on the credit card, by the time you're done, you pay like two grand. Yeah. So that, that's a cool option. Thank you for that question. Um, when I, when I, teach, I teach in college, I teach internationally, I teach nationally, and, and one of the things that I always do when I end my courses is, is I do uh, a list of what I call uh, takeaways. You know, it's kind of like a little stuff home with you. This is kind of like a little summary sheet. Sorry. A little summary sheet of, um, again, more stuff for you. Uh, just a summary sheet of some of the things we discussed, so we can have a little bit more of an open discussion. Uh, uh, these takeaways, uh, start your financial journey by increasing your giving today. And just think about that for a minute. If you went home tonight and just say, you know what, outside of my automatic deduction of what I pay on Sunday, I'm just gonna send $10 to Discovery because I'm gonna let go of my financial, this prison that money is, has got me into. Some of the best times we had since we've been here is when Dawn says, oh, you wanna increase our, our monthly to Discovery? Uh, they need this at Discovery. You want to do it? You want to buy it? I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. It's like, years ago, it was like, well, do they really need it? Now it's like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> because there really is a joy in that giving, and we're thankful that we're, we're able to, to do it. In fact, Mike just sent me a message today for fifth payment on Kids Camp or something like that. That's right. I said, there's another one. So that's what we're talking about on the way home today, All right? Your financial future is all about the decisions you make, your relationship with your mate, and your relationship with God. And you really need to in, include God in, in, your, in your, your prayer time, in your discussions, in your, in your devotions uh, about finances, and it's okay to pray for your financial future. We pray frequently for but for God's prosperity to prosper us so that so that we can fund more ministries and support more things. But she goes up to Mustard Seed and says, I saw Stacy today, they really need this. And the nurse used to say, like, is it okay if I do it? Now I said, I just went and did it. We just did it. We go to Fort Pierce and, and we know so many people through world changers and, and our ministry events and well I saw so and so and and they needed food, so I just gave them money. Well, that's, that's what we're able to do. Uh, another takeaway, do not use credit cards. Use cash whenever possible. 
my son, my older son, he's a, he could be a whole class discussion <laughs> with him. Um, he went last time, he bought his boat, was about three years ago? Yeah. Guy says, oh, it's $79,000, not a penny less. So he calls up and says, I'll give you $72,000 cash. And big man that he is, sent his wife down with a cigar box of $72,000 in $100 bills and bought a boat. I'm not recommending you do that, okay? I'm not recommending you do that. But people, when they see cash, they react a little differently to cash, especially some of us more boomers than millennials. Um, so, and also when you use cash, you don't tend to spend as much. That's it. And also realize that everyone has some form of money struggles. People I know that are very rich, people that are not very rich, everybody has some form of money struggle. So we are not 